Good morning. Welcome to the Western Historical Society Museum and our display on the First World War. I'm Dick Troxell. This is Neil Horner. We're members of the Western Historical Society and we'll be your guides through this exhibit. Why bother with World War I at all? After all, it started a hundred years ago. Everybody who fought in it or was associated with it in any way is long gone. And it's ancient history, right? Actually, it made a very violent change in world history, not only for nations, but for thousands, millions of individual families as well. Now, if you want to get the big picture about the war, where the armies went, what the nations did, what happened afterwards with the treaties and so forth, you won't find that here. You will have had to have gone to our series of lectures and films, which we jointly sponsored with the Friends of the Western Library, or your own personal reading. The purpose of this exhibit is to bring the war down to a personal basis, to give an idea of the individuals who were involved, what they did, what kinds of weapons they carried, how they were uniformed, and how they lived. And we are especially proud of our Western Wall, which displays the pictures of many who fought in the war who have descendants living in Weston today. So there is a clear local connection and local interest. Now at our display, we begin with the world leaders. Here we have five portrait photographs of men who were in power during World War I. Beginning with this man uh, on the left-hand end of the top row, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States from 1913 to 1921. And President Wilson managed to keep America out of the war until 1917, and we'll be talking more about that later. <clears throat> Next to President Wilson is King George V of Great Britain. And the other civilian on the top row is Raymond Poincaré, President of France from 1913 to 1920. On the bottom row, we have, at the left, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and alongside, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. Now, Kaiser is simply a German word borrowed from Latin, and it means emperor. And czar, or tsar, is the Russian equivalent of the same word. Now, if you detect some family resemblance among these three men in uniform, you're right, because they were cousins. Wilhelm and George were both grandsons of Britain's Queen Victoria. And Tsar Nicholas, and King George, their mothers were sisters. The princesses Alexander and Dagmar of the royal family of Denmark. So these men were all related. Now this raises the question, what power did these crowned heads actually have? Bear in mind that in 1914, every nation in Europe, with the sole exceptions of France and Switzerland, was a monarchy of some sort or another. Well, King George didn't have any power at all, really. Under the British system of government, it was wholly the responsibility of the prime minister and his cabinet to declare war. The king had no voice in it. Because the British officials, the prime minister and his cabinet, were already, by definition, members of parliament, they were elected politicians. The Tsar had some power. We know that in Russia at the time, the armies could not march, mobilization could not start, unless the Tsar himself personally signed the orders. As far as Kaiser Wilhelm is concerned, he was largely constrained by what his military advisors told him. I'd like to show you our western wall but on the way, have a look at these recruiting posters. And this one in particular. It says the Doughboys make good, and there are two machine gunners. 
Now, doughboys were what American soldiers in World War I were termed, like the term GI used in World War II was what the ordinary soldier was called. Nobody really knows why they were called doughboys. One theory is that they liked fried bread and donuts. The other theory is that the English soldiers thought the Americans were overpaid, had too much dough, hence the term doughboys, but nobody really knows. Now, our western wall of World War I fighters with descendants living in Weston today. Have a look at this family group here. This is an Austrian officer, his wife and children. The officer is Colonel Johann Georg Taschel, a career officer in the Royal Imperial Austro-Hungarian Army. He's my wife's grandfather. The young boy in the sailor suit, his son, was my wife's father. And he is, his name was also Johann, or John as we came to know him. He's the grandfather of my three children, who include Weston's chief of police, John Troxell, and Susan Haven, my daughter, who has for many years worked in the Weston schools as a librarian and teacher's assistant. This is an example of a family that was sundered and reassembled by the war in a way that the family members could not possibly have imagined before 1914. Colonel Toschel died in November of 1914. At that time, his son Johann, or John, was in cadet school, planning to follow in his father's footsteps in a military career. But at the end of the war, Austria was on the losing side. The Austro-Hungarian Empire broke up. The cadet school was closed and the army was dissolved. So young Johann, or John, had no future. So he came to America. He married a Canadian woman. They settled in the United States. They, my wife, who later, the woman who later became my wife, was the result. And that is how one half of my family was, was, uh, came to be. If it had not been for the First World War, my family would be made up of an entirely different uh, makeup. Now, Neil is going to take you through the rest of the uh, pictures here. Thank you, Richard. As Richard mentioned at the outset, uh, every individual on this wall or these walls either lived in Weston at some point in time or their descendants uh, live in Weston today. And again, we are trying to show the human aspect of the war. All of these individuals served in some way in the war. Some served with uh, honor and bravery. They all served with commitment. And in some cases, there are legacies that are truly amazing. And I, I'm looking forward to telling you about some of them. Let's begin here. We have pictures of four German grenadiers, which is the term used for the ordinary German soldier. At the top, we have Felix and Leopold Muller. Felix is the grandfather of David Muller, who is a selectman, a board of selectmen today. Leopold, his uh, brother, as you can see, was wounded in the war. As a matter of fact, he lost the use of his left arm as a result of that wound. The wound is the uh, great uncle of David. Now, Felix uh, and Leopold, after the war, when the Nazis took over in Nazi Germany about 1933, they suffered immensely from discrimination and persecution as Jews. Felix wanted to keep his family safe, of course, and he thought the best place, the best way to do that is to take the family to a major urban area. So they moved to Frankfurt, uh, Germany uh, in, the, in the 1930s. However, in 1938, he was arrested, he was released, and he made his way to Switzerland, but he had no right to stay in Switzerland according to the convention of the country at that time. So he was fortunate enough to have a cousin who, ha uh, who was able to sponsor him on a visa to make the trip to the United States in 1941, where he lived until 1979 when he died. However, Leopold, who was also arrested uh, uh, and released and then re-arrested again, 
was taken from a small town called Bad Kissingen, a spa town in Bavaria, to the east to a camp, and he and his family were killed at that camp in 1942. These two gentlemen here, again, two ordinary soldiers, are Wilhelm Schussler, who is the grandfather of Rosemary Stock, Weston resident, and her great uncle, Edward Balke, who was also a uh, member of the German Imperial Army at that time. They were both restaurateurs and owners of pubs, and uh, Mr. Balke, or Herr Balke, was also a master carpenter. They were fairly ordinary middle class people before, they wo before the war. They fought well in the war from 1914 to 1917 and came back home and took over the same jobs and occupations that they had before the war. Here we have a very interesting poster of a very intense man. His name is Lord Kitchener. He was the Secretary of State for War for Great Britain uh, at the beginning of the war. And he is imploring all young men to join the, the British Army. This iconic poster led to the uh, poster that was de developed by James Montgomery Flagg in 1916, just before the Americans entered the war. This poster was uh, developed in September of 1914 and was plastered all over Great Britain. There were thousands of them in Trafalgar Square on Nelson's Column. Today there are only four left uh, in known existence in the world and they're all back in England. Posters from this were not uncommon. The Germans had a poster just like it that said, you should join the army. The Russians had another one with the same image of a soldier pointing at you, imploring you. The Russian one said, why aren't you in the army? A question that had to be very carefully answered at that time. One more poster that uh, resulted from this image was one that we may all know and remember in the poster of Smokey the Bear, who reaches out and says, only you can prevent forest fires. So this image was pervasive across the uh, decades. This gentleman here is James Downey Thompson. He is the grandfather of Barbara Rome Gross, and he's a Scotsman. And he joined the first Royal Dragoons in the British Army and spent the entire war, 1914 to 1980, in that unit. He survived, he came back to Great Britain, and lived, uh, lived a full life. This is now the American wall that I'm going to uh, take you through. And uh, we'll start with this gentleman here. His name is Emil Pearson. He is the father of uh, Sharon Gilbert, who is the archivist of the Western Historical Society and has been serving the society for over 11 years. Underneath you see the honor roll a certificate that was presented to him which shows the date of his enlistment and also the unit that he was in, the 339th Infantry. This picture of these three gentlemen, I believe this picture was taken before they were embarking upon their trip to, uh, to serve in Europe. They are three of the Moore brothers. They're three of 13 siblings of the Moore family that lived at Weston about the time of the uh, First World War. On the left is Frederick Moore. He joined at age 17. He went to Europe. He fought bravely. He uh, fought in the Battle of Meuse Argonne, which was the biggest American battle during the uh, First World War. Over a million men spread across 100 miles on the Western Front fought in that particular battle. He unfortunately was killed at the end of September at the Meuse Argonne. He was brought back. He is now buried in the Coley uh, Cemetery, the Weston Cemetery on Weston Road. His brothers, Miller and Minor, did return after the war. However, Miller uh, Moore suffered from a gas attack and gas poisoning, and he died at a very young age um, between World War I and World War II. Moore still live in the uh, Weston and Fairfield County area descendants of these of this family, the Moors that were uh, uh, in Weston in the, uh, about uh, the time of the First World War. This gentleman here, William Sweet, it's Corporal William Sweet, he's a Marine. Corporal Sweet is the father of Shirley Stanton of Weston. Shirley and her husband Warren Stanton are longtime residents of Weston. He did not set foot on land in terms of participating in the war, he was assigned to a Marine unit on the USS Oklahoma, 
This is Captain Ernest Stanton. He is the father of Warren Stanton. And his career in the, in the, uh, during World War I was quite unusual. He joined at a very young age an organization called the American Field Service. The American Field Service was an organization made up entirely of volunteers, primarily Americans, whose job it was to drive ambulances and to drive truck convoys in France during the early part of, the, of World War I, 1915 and 1916. This was a very interesting unit. Ambulance drivers are, uh, have a well-known legacy and history. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, John Dos Passos, uh, Somerset Maughan, all part of the lost generation, drove ambulances during the early part of the war. Composers like Maurice Ravel, for example, was also an ambulance driver, as was Walt Disney. As a matter of fact, his ambulance in France has a cartoon character painted on the side of his, uh, of his ambulance. In 1916, uh, Ernest Stanton, the ambulance driver, came back to the United States, was married in uh, Gross Isle, Michigan, and joined uh, the officer training school and was commissioned a first lieutenant, went back to France, fought uh, in the same areas that he drove uh, ambulances, Verdun, for example. He was wounded by shrapnel in the uh, Battle of, the, uh, of, of uh, Verdun, and he received many decorations, including, of course, the Purple Heart and the Victory Medal with four bars. His uh, brother is Captain, is Captain Henry Stanton. Captain Henry Stanton was a captain of an uh, artillery company and served in France from uh, uh, September of 1918 until February of 1919 when he was discharged. Yeah, here in this uh, Corporal Shemin is the cousin of the grandmother of Dan Gerstein, a Western resident. And this story is remarkable in that it is still in the news today. Corporal Shemin uh, fought in many, many battles in France. In one battle, uh, the second battle of the Marne, he ran back and forth between the trenches over no man's land, uh, rescuing fellow soldiers, carrying them or leading them to safety. He uh, was wounded several times during that action. And it was a three-day battle, and he kept this up for the entire duration of that segment of the battle. After the war, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the nation's second highest military award. But the story only really began there. In the 1980s, his daughter, Ruth Shemin Roth, who lives in Missouri, just a few miles south of St. Louis, started a uh, program, was a driving force to influence a Missouri congressman his name was Blaine Lukemeyer in the 1980s and 1990s to develop a bill that was eventually presented to Congress in 2011 that would authorize a review of all Jewish World War I veterans to determine if, in effect, they were overlooked for the Medal of Honor uh, based upon their exploits. That review has been completed, and it has been determined that Sergeant Shemin, as he was promoted after the war for his exploits, Sergeant Shemin is, should receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. The Secretary of Defense has approved it. It is now ready to be uh, presented by the President, President Obama, and it should be just a matter of time when that award posthumously will be made. It's quite a story because it took essentially 90 or 100 years to complete. Yeah, here in this very small picture, we have five soldiers lined up in front of their barracks. The second from the right is Norman Holt, and he is the father of Mrs. Richard Pike, a Weston resident. This is, Ru this is Ruth Marie Treadwell. She was a Navy nurse. She joined the United States Naval Reserve Forces 
and she served on the East Coast in hospitals, including the Naval Hospital in Annapolis and also the Naval Hospital in Newport News. She met her uh, then-to-be husband at uh, a medic that was at the Newport News Hospital serving with her. After the war, she came back to Weston and became a school teacher at the Good Hill School. This gentleman here in the civilian clothes is Giacinto Di Pasquale, and he was an Italian immigrant that immigrated to New Jersey and is the grandfather of Jess Di Pasquale, who is on the Board of Police Commissioners for Weston. Now, Giacinto, this is his discharge. This is his enlistment papers. He was gassed and uh, suffered a gas attack when he was in Europe. He won the, uh, he was awarded the Purple Heart, and we have his medals. Uh, they were also donated by uh, Jesse D. Pasquale, and there we'll, we'll show them to you in a few minutes. Now this picture, there are no Western residents as far as we know in this picture. It is the Rainbow Division. It is marching underneath the Arc de Triomphe on July 4th in 1917, just after they landed, and they were on their way to the, uh, to the battle zone. This gentleman here is Sergeant McAdam Ransom. He is the father of Jane Gray. He was a Marine, a Marine Sergeant at this time, and you can see pinned to his tunic is the Croix de Guerre. The Croix de Guerre was the... Uh, the uh, award given most prominently to foreigners for their service to France in the, in the World Wars. And Richard, why don't you take it from here and yes. describe this gentleman. Thank you. This is First Lieutenant Willard W. Troxell of the Corps of Engineers. He's my father. He was a civil engineer by profession. He joined the Army, got a direct commission as a First Lieutenant in 1917 went to France in early 1918, served in, first in what was called then the defensive sector, which was a quiet sector in Alsace down near the Swiss border, was then transferred up, or his uh, unit, the 104th Engineer Regiment, was moved up to the front in support of the Meuse Argonne Offensive, which began September 26, 1918. And he, his unit fought all throughout that offensive up until the armistice in 1918. He remained in France in 19, until 1919 because at that point there were something like two and a half million Americans in France and there weren't enough ships to bring them all at home at the same time, so they had to wait. And the American army was parceled out into front to French villages uh, all over the country uh, awaiting shipment. Uh, my father returned in 1919 he married the same girl that he'd been seeing until before he went off to war. So he is an example of one whose life was really not uh, affected or interrupted by the war. Uh, his life wasn't changed, but I think his psychology was because my mother told me once that in the early years of their marriage, in the early 1920s, my father would frequently have nightmares. And when wakened up by my, my mother, he would say, the damn Germans were chasing me again. We have his insignia of rank, his Corps of Engineers insignia, uh, and his victory medal, uh, which he received along with all others who served in France, uh, in the display case. Thank you, Richard. Now we have Private Thomas Peterson. He is the father of Phyllis Gary, a longtime resident of Weston, and uh, noted for her community service throughout the community. <clears throat> his, uh, his story is quite interesting in a couple of ways. Uh, he was in the same division, the 82nd Division, in the same regiment as Sergeant Alvin York, uh, the famous war hero of which much has been written and movies made. They served together in training at Camp Gordon in Georgia, went overseas together, and served on the front lines at the Meuse Argonne, during the Meuse Argonne battle. Now, Private Peterson himself, fighting bravely, was, the, uh, was in a machine gun pl platoon and was one of only two members of that platoon that survived that battle. Now, here we have a photo of Private Horace Hurlbut, Jr. 
Uh, Private Herbert en enlisted in October of 1917 at the age of 30, which was, he was not a young man to be joining the army. He was pictured next to the ambulance he drove in France during the war. Now his ambulance unit it's quite uh, unique because it was assigned to the Escadrille Lafayette Flying Corps. And that was a group of mostly American flyers supporting the French uh, throughout the war. He was awarded the French Croix de Guerre with a silver star for, as it was indicated on the certificate given to him with the Croix de Guerre, for coolness under intense fire. And that certificate was signed by Marshal Pétain, who was nicknamed the Lion of Verdun. Unfortunately, Private Hurlbut was killed in an auto accident in Westport just six days before his medal arrived in Weston. In 1932, his father, Horace Hurlbut Sr., gave a 10-acre parcel of land that he had purchased for $50,000 to the town of Weston, and that was in the memory of his son. And this uh, land became the site of our Herbert School. This is Captain Samuel Shether. Uh, he did not live in Weston at uh, the beginning of the war. He arrived later on. But his story is quite interesting as well, as all of the stories of these individuals. Uh, he went to uh, Europe and, and began his, uh, his time in France in uh, February of 1918. Right after he got there, he caught the flu, influenza, which of course was a devastating disease in 1918 and 1919, killing over 20 million people in, in, uh, around the world during that two-year time frame. While well, he was confined to a hospital but didn't want to stay there, he heard the sounds of battle, decided to leave unauthorized, went back to his unit, and led a mission to locate the uh, battalion commander who was missing at that time. Uh, they found the commander, however, during that particular mission, he was wounded and gassed. He received the Croix de Guerre with four citations and uh, came back to Weston in 1920, came back to live in Weston. In 1927, he was elected as a first selectman of the Weston uh, Board of Selectmen. He also was elected to the state legislature in 1932. This gentleman here is Lieutenant Percy Talmadge Wright. We're going to hear more about him in just a few minutes. He was the captain of a submarine, the L-9, that patrolled the coastline of America but was actually stationed in the Irish Sea. Uh, he played an integral part in the protection of the sea lanes, again, of the convoys between America and Europe. But we'll hear more about him when we discuss the role of the navies, the various navies, during World War I. Now let's go over here and look at these other objects that have been donated. It's, impor it's important to note that almost all of these objects were loaned to the Western Historical Society for this exhibit. Let's begin with the uniforms. This is the uniform of the common German soldier, the Grenadier. You can see the iconic helmet with the spike on top, which was replaced with a more traditional battle helmet later on in the war. This is a canister that contained the gas mask. This is his canteen. And there are two uh, pouches. Each one contained a cartridge clip. Over here on the right, we have three uniforms. The one in the middle, the one that is standing up taller is the uniform of the ordinary British soldier, the Tommy. Uh, it's made out of uh, wool, as is this uniform, made out of wool. And okay, on the right we have the, uh, the French uniform with the uh, classic French canteen that looks somewhat like a wine flask and the very different coloring of, uh, of the fabric. The one on the left is the uniform of Captain Ernest Stanton. It's his dress uniform. It's made out of cotton. And below that are the uh, trousers and the boots that were associated with that dress uniform. In this case, we have a number of items loaned to the society. In the back and on the left are two porcelain mugs, both belonging to a German officer. These were loaned to the society by Rosemarie Stock. 
They are officers' personal souvenirs that illustrate his time in service in the German Army from 1910 to 1917 when his service ended. The one on the right recognizes his time in training before the war from 1910 to 1913 with high relief depictions of his unit and the exercises that they experienced in preparation for the war. The one on the left, in the same style, has images of a battle in which he fought during the war. Now these inscriptions demonstrate his loyalty and his dedication and love of service to Germany. The inscription on the lid of the one depicting his most memorable battle, the one on the left, says, Farewell, dear company, farewell, dear regiment, the heart now leads us back home. In memory of my service, 1913 to 1917. In memory of the battle between Metz and the Vosigesen on August 2014, under the leadership of His Royal Highness Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria. Now between the mugs are several German iron crosses, loaned to the society by Warren Stanton, and retrieved from the battlefield by his father, Captain Ernest Stanton. One is particularly unusual for it still has the ribbon attached, which most often was lost or deteriorated over time. Now as we move inside the cabinet, we'll begin with these rifles. There are two of them as we can see. The one in front is a German Mauser. It was introduced as the uh, common weapon for the German army in 1898. The one behind it is the American Springfield rifle, which was introduced to the American Army in 1903. As you can tell, they look somewhat similar, same caliber, same mechanism, and they should look similar because the American Springfield rifle copied many of the features of the German Mauser. We also see in front of the American Springfield rifle a grenade launcher that was inserted into the bore of the rifle and then fired as if you were firing a shot. The launcher, the great grenade being launched in this way was a lot safer for the troops. Of course, they could stay in their trenches, pull the trigger, the object would be launched as opposed to getting on top and throwing the grenade and being exposed. There's the bayonet. The first bayonet next to the Mauser belongs to the Mauser. You can see the serrations on the handle. The bayonet next to it is the one that belongs to the Springfield uh, rifle. It is a bit longer and has a more narrow uh, scabbard and blade. Now, in front we have a series of medals that belong to the individuals that we have previously discussed. Here is the Marine Corps emblem and the Good Conduct Medal for William Sweet, Corporal William Sweet, the Marine. Next to it, are, are three medals, two here in this black uh, frame and the purple heart next to it. These belong to Captain Ernest Stanton. The one in the middle is called a victory medal and it is given to anyone who served in a combat zone during the war. This one as you can see has four brass bars on it. Each one indicates a particular campaign that Captain Stanton was involved in. They were the Marne, Sam Hill, Meuse Argonne, and the American Defensive Sector. Now next to it is his Purple Heart. It's in the original box, which is quite scarce. And above it you see a cer certificate. And the certificate says, served with honor in the World War and was wounded in action and has his name on it. Now next to it we have the Purple Heart that was given to Giacinto Di Pasquale after he returned from the war, as, as we remember, he was gassed during the Battle of Argonne. That's a certificate that goes with his Purple Heart. And down below is a letter that accompanied the heart, awarding him the Purple Heart. And right there beneath the certificate is a picture of Gicento di Pasquale in his uniform. Now next to it we have other medals that were given to him, but these are all medals that were presented to him after he returned from World War I. There's a medal recognizing his service from the state of New Jersey, and there's the American Legion Medal next to it, and there are other medals, some are buttons that were presented to him for various towns, including his hometown of Bayonne in New Jersey. Behind that we see a badge, which is another state uh, recognition 
It is a patch from the state of Connecticut recognizing the service of someone that was from the state of Connecticut. And now what I'd like to do is turn the last group of medals over to my colleague, Richard Troxell, who will describe their origin. <clears throat> uh, these are my father's insignia and his victory medal. The pin in the shape of a castle is the emblem of the Corps of Engineers. The duty of the engineers in a combat situation was to build roads, build bridges, support the troops in any way they could, clear uh, lane, uh, areas of fire, fields of fire, uh, tear down old barbed wire and that sort of thing. My father commented that they were living in pup tents, which kept out neither the rain nor the German shells. The bars are his insignia of rank, silver bars for a first lieutenant, and there of course is the victory medal with two bars one for Merz Argonne and one for the defensive sector, and the bit of ribbon uh, that is worn on the ordinary uniform to uh, designate the entire medal. The last few objects that I'd like to uh, talk to in this case are the pictures in the back of the case. On the left is Captain Stanton in his dress uniform that we described before. Now the two on the right, we're going to spend more time on the subject of these photographs. In the middle you see a, a photograph of a small dog. His name is Sergeant Stubby. And Sergeant Stubby was a war hero. He became a member of the 102nd Regiment, the Connecticut Regiment, that went to France. Stubby went with him and we'll describe his exploits in a few minutes. He trained with his unit, the 102nd Regiment, in the Yale Bowl. And there's a picture of the tents in the Yale Bowl in New Haven. So with that, I will turn back to my colleague who will describe the Air War. World War I was the first war in which aviation was a factor. Uh, of course, airplanes had been developed earlier on, but they were used in warfare for the first time in the 1914-1918 war. Now here we have a, sec a segment of the propeller from a German plane, bearing a brand name Wotan, named for one of the Norse gods. And this is the man who flew the plane. Apparently after the war, he managed to slice off part of the, of the propeller, which you notice is made of laminated wood, and keep that for a souvenir. Looking at the photographic array here, on top we have German balloons now, we're not quite sure what these particular balloons were used for. Possibly observation, possibly uh, to protect ground installations in some way. We don't really know because there's an absence of equipment hanging here. There are no motors, there's no cab. In any event, the Germans used these extensively. The picture below shows a French aviator loading the machine gun in his plane. Now, the fully automatic machine gun was first used in warfare in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. And on the ground, it's a devastating weapon. It was a devastating weapon in the First World War and contributed hugely to the enormous casualties in that war. But when you wed the automatic machine gun to the airplane, you get something brand new. You get what the military today calls a weapon system and it made possible a whole new form of combat, air-to-air, plane-to-plane combat, which later became known as dogfighting. To the right is a British pursuit plane uh, waiting to take off. Now, planes were also used for bombardment, and over here in the display case, we have an early bomb site. Now, why does there have to be a special site for a bomb? Well, if you're going to drop a bomb on a target from an airplane, you can't wait until you're right over the target, because if you do, you'll miss every time. And the reason is that the bomb, when released, has the forward speed of the airplane that it's being dropped from. So it actually falls in a curve. If I want to hit a target represented by, say, that knot in the, in the floor up there, I have to release my bomb back here somewhere. This is what's called the release point. And the purpose of a bomb site is to tell the bombardier when he has reached his release point. There are settings on the bomb site for altitude, forward speed, that sort of thing. This is a rather crude 
an early uh, example, but that's what a bomb sight does. It tells the bombardier when to release the bomb so that it will hit the target. Now over here, we have pictures of soldiers doing various things. First of all, two items of equipment. Uh, this is a web, uh, web belt which carries a of American issue, which carries uh, ammunition pouches, a first aid kit, and a canteen. That was standard issue for all American soldiers. This is a balaclava. It's a homemade item of apparel. One thing that women on the home front were encouraged to do was knit socks and other, other apparel for the soldiers at the front. And this, is, this was one of the popular items. It's a balaclava. It goes over the head, fits under a helmet, and uh, it's good foul weather gear. Now here in this picture display, we have soldiers doing various things. We have some equipment. But I draw your attention particularly to the panoramic photograph at the top, this triptych, as it were. That is Flanders Fields. Flanders Fields was an area of Belgium fought over by the British and the Germans for four years, back and forth, back and forth. That's what a battlefield look like, looks like when the battle is over. If you visit battlefields in Europe today, you'll find that they're all pretty up. They're clean, the grass is mown, there are monuments around, and it's quiet. That's not what a battlefield really is. This is what a battlefield is. The one thing that the photograph cannot transmit to you is what it smells like. Now, we have soldiers marching in formation, probably Americans, judging by the hats they're wearing. Uh, soldiers getting ready to be hauled off in a, free, in, a, uh, in a railroad car. These railroad cars were called 40 and 8s. They were built by the French, and they were called 40 and 8s because they were designed to carry 40 men and 8 horses. Now here is a picture of General Pershing and his staff. This is Pershing. This officer, the second one from the right on the back row, is named George Catlett Marshall. He was Pershing's logistics expert. He did all of the planning for the logistics for the first division, and later had to do, had to do the planning for all of the logistics for the entire American Expeditionary Force, or AEF. George Marshall was a professional officer. He was a graduate of Virginia Military Institute. He stayed in the Army after the war. He became Chief of Staff of the United States Army, which is the highest uniform job, in 1939, picked for that job by President Franklin Roosevelt. There were about 20 or 30 other generals in line ahead of him for the job, but Roosevelt reached down and grabbed Marshall it was a brilliant selection because Marshall did a fantastic job of strategic and logistical planning during World War II. He later became United States Secretary of State and was the author of the Marshall Plan at the end of World War II. The Marshall Plan is, I believe, the only example in, in history of when a victorious nation paid the entire cost of rebuilding the defeated nations. Prior to that time, as exemplified, for example, in the Versailles Treaty, the idea was the loser pays the bill. We learned that that didn't work, so we did it a different way at the end of World War II, and that was designed by then General Marshall. Over here we have a tank. Now the tank was a true innovation in the First World War. It was invented by the British. It first appeared in combat in 1916 in, at Cambrai. The early tanks were unreliable. The engines broke down. The treads fell off. They could not exploit the, break, the breakthrough that they created. But the design quickly matured. At its peak, the American Army had a tank corps of about 350 tanks, mostly of French manufacture. They were commanded by one Lieutenant Colonel George Patton. Patton was also a career officer who stayed in the Army, originally a cavalryman. He became a noted leader of armored force in the Second World War 
and was the subject of a Hollywood movie some years ago. Now, I'm making a point here, and the point I'm making is that many of the great military leaders of World War II learned their craft in World War I. Now, Neil is going to tell you all about Sergeant Stubby. Well, Richard uh, Troxell mentioned at the beginning that uh, this is somewhat of a unique exhibit because we're going to capture more of the human aspect of the war. Now, this is kind of a human aspect. It's also a canine aspect of World War I. We're going to tell a story about Sergeant Stubby. Sergeant Stubby was a hero, a hero dog during the war. It began when Sergeant Stubby was just a pup. He was a little brindle puppy who wandered into the Yale Bowl in the middle of July of 1917. Now, the Yale Bowl at that time was being used as the base of training for the Connecticut 102nd Infantry Regiment. So Sergeant Stubby wanders in, he's a stray, and he's rescued by Private Robert Conroy, who in effect becomes his master. Now Stubby is accepted by the regiment as one of them. Uh, he trains with them, he marches with them, he learns how to march with the bugle call, and he learns how to recognize the, the time for chow. Uh, he also learned to salute. He would lift his little paw up to his right eyebrow and give a little tick and salute whoever he felt was appropriate or that his owner felt was appropriate. Now, after training, Sergeant Stubby was smuggled aboard the train that took the regiment to the point of a part of port of embarkation, which is Newport News, Virginia. So uh, he was held, he was hid, hidden under the tunic of Private Conroy during that trip, so that the various officers walking up and down the aisle would not notice him. He was smuggled on board the SS Minnesota, which was the transport, the troop transport that took the regiment to Europe. In the middle of the voyage. Halfway out uh, on our way, he was brought up from his hiding space, which was a coal bin in the very, very bottom of the ship. And he was brought up for some fresh air, was allowed to run around on deck. He met the other soldiers, he met the sailors, and became a real companion for the rest of the voyage. Now the problem was getting him off the ship. He was again smuggled off the ship under the tunic of Private Conroy. But just as they arrived and were uh, at the, at the uh, part where they de-embarked, the Commandant came by on inspection and noticed that there indeed was a small dog underneath the tunic of Robert Conroy. He admonished the private and said that they were not allowed, and what did Subby do when he was put down on the ground? He saluted the Commandant. The Commandant thought, well, this is a very special animal. He issued special orders for Star uh, Sergeant Stubby to become the official mascot of the regiment. So Stubby was now ingrained in the uh, regiment as a member of their force. He fought or was in 17 battles in Europe. He was wounded many times, four times seriously as a matter of fact. But he had certain skills that actually saved lives. Uh, one of his uh, ordeals was suffering uh, a gas attack and he was hospitalized in a field hospital to recover. As a result of that, attack, uh, that gas attack, he became very sensitive to the smell of gas. So later on in battles, he would sense that there was gas on its way. He would jump into the trenches, and he would bite and bark, uh, at, the, bark at his, uh, his fellow soldiers, bite them in order to alert them that indeed they better prepare for this gas attack. They would don their gas mask and put a little gas mask on Stubby as well. He also had a keen sense of hearing, and he could hear the artillery shells as they were being launched before the soldiers could hear them. He would bark and warn them to take cover. As I mentioned, he was wounded. Uh, he was wounded by a German hand grenade that was thrown as the German was retreating. However, he did recover from that, and as a result, he became quite uh, interested in getting even with the Germans. 
One day he found a German in an abandoned American trench who was mapping American positions, and he jumped into the, into the trench, grabbed the German by the uh, leg, then grabbed him by the pants until the, the American soldiers could come and uh, take him away. Now, after uh, being wounded, he was taken first to a field hospital and then to an American Red Cross hospital, which became the, uh, the hospital of choice, if you will, during the second half of the World War. Uh, second half of the World War. Uh, here you see an American ambulance, uh, not taking Stubby necessarily, but here you do see a picture of Stubby in front of a poster uh, promoting the American Red Cross. He became the poster dog or the poster boy for the American Red Cross, as well as receiving an honor uh, from the American Legion. Here's a picture of him being presented with that gold medal from the American Legion by General Pershing with Private Conroy in the background. Now over here, uh, it wasn't just Sergeant Stubby who was uh, able to uh, sense and recognize a gas attack. This is a French soldier with a French dog. And you can see that they're both equipped with a gas mask. Horses as well, of course, had their uh, had gas masks because horses were the burden of, uh, of uh, work, if you will, for much of the uh, much of the war. Now here's a picture of Sergeant Stubby. Uh, actually, this picture is during training. You can see him with his tunic on, his hat on, and his fellow soldiers standing behind him. Now Sergeant Stubby survived the war. As I mentioned, he was in 17 battles. He came back to the United States with Private Conroy, who by then was Sergeant Conroy. And Sergeant Conroy was discharged and went to Georgetown University to study law. And of course he took Sergeant Stubby along with him. Now here's a picture of Sergeant Stubby in front of the football team, the Hoyas of Georgetown University. Halftime show for Georgetown was Stubby in the middle of the field, pushing a football up and down and occasionally tapping it with his paw. Instead of cheerleaders and a marching band, the Hoyas were very, very happy to have Stubby on board. So that's the story of Stubby with one final comment. Here is Stubby long after the war. He died at the age of nine. This is him. It's a plaster cast. I must say that this is his skin and his medals and his tunic. It was given to him by the ladies from the San Hill, which is one of the battles that he was in. So he is in the Smithsonian Institution. Anyone who's interested in the story of Stubby can visit him in Washington, D.C. One doesn't ordinarily think of the First World War as a naval war, a war at sea. We're familiar with the trenches, the ground war, the movement of the armies, all that sort of thing, but not what happened at sea. It was, in fact, the war at sea that drew America into the war, and that happened this way. President Wilson had decreed a policy of absolute neutrality when the war broke out in 1914. No favor to one side or the other. In fact, he tried to spread this doctrine of neutrality to the citizenry at large. My mother told me that she remembered little signs in the movie theaters at the time, don't cheer the newsreels, we're neutral. In early 1917, the German general staff looked at their maps of the Western Front and concluded that they were stuck. They were not going to dislodge the, dislodge the British and the French. Nothing was going to happen one way or the other of any significance. They needed a breakthrough. And they decided the only thing they could do would be to knock one of the Allies out of the war. Great Britain, being an island, was the obvious candidate and they would do it by unrestricted submarine warfare. This meant that they, they ordered their U-boats to torpedo any ship flying any flag approaching the coast of Great Britain or France. Any kind of ship, merchant ship, warship, somebody's private yacht, whatever. If it was approaching the war zone, it would be torpedoed without warning. Naturally, in carrying out this policy, they torpedoed a number of American ships with loss of American lives. And after protesting to no avail to the, to the German government, President Wilson submitted to Congress a request for a declaration of war, which the Congress enacted 
and we were brought into war that way. Now, one of the people in our Western display over there was Lieutenant Percy Wright of the United States Navy. He is the grandfather of Mrs. Richard Wolfe, a resident of Weston. He was a submarine commander. And this is his submarine, the L-9. There is Lieutenant Wright, or Captain Wright, as we give him his proper courtesy title, taking a sighting with a sextant. Here he is with his officers. Now, the L-9 was a very small submarine. Submarines were small in those days. And it had to be towed to its patrol station in the Irish Sea because it didn't have enough fuel capacity to make the journey under its own power, unlike the submarines of World War II, for example. So here we have pictures of the submarine, pictures of, of uh, Captain Wright. And this wheel here is a control wheel for the diving planes of an American submarine. Over in the display case here, we have parts of Lieutenant or Captain Wright's dress uniform, the gold epaulets, the, uh, the hat, and so forth. The model here is a model of a submarine chaser or submarine uh, uh, killer. Uh, these were produced in great number in World War I, uh, and they were used for anti-submarine patrol. At the end of the war, the troops came home. And there was the job then was to integrate them back into the economy with jobs. Here's a U.S. Employment Service a Department of Labor poster. And here is an honor roll of returning troops. And here is something we should never forget. We saw what a battlefield looks like after the battle. This is what remains. France and Belgium are dotted with American military cemeteries from the First World War. They are beautifully kept. They are inspiring to visit. But they don't tell you the real cost. There is, there is an American cemetery. Here is a very touching cartoon that I'm going to try to translate to French. This is a book plate, and it shows a little French girl in mourning with a memorial wreath, and she's decorating the grave. And it says, if my, if my high school French serves correctly, this book is dedicated to the children of those who have given their lives for the salvation of France and the liberation of Alsace and Lorraine. This ends our exhibition. Thank you for your attention.